My Lords, my Lords, the current provision of mental health services for British Sign Language using deaf uh, people is poor and is likely to get worse if the government don't wake up to the problems which will be caused by the move towards using co-commissioning groups for specialised services within the NHS. My Lords, last March I held a similar debate on the physical health of deaf people. Um, this debate uh, today is about the mental health, uh, mental health services for BSL using deaf people, and it draws on similar research, namely that 40% of deaf people are likely to experience mental health problems in their lifetime, compared to 25% of the hearing population. Indeed, my Lords, recent research by the Sick of It campaign suggests that the figure for deaf people could be much higher than the 40% I've just quoted. So, my Lords, what makes deaf mental health different? The, the incidence of schizophrenia among the deaf population is about the same as that for the hearing population. But for more common mental health problems, like depression and anxiety, the incidence is much higher. My Lords, this is believed to be due to a variety of factors, but particularly to social isolation and also the difficulty communicating with parents when deaf people are growing up. My Lords, I find it very interesting that deaf people who have deaf parents are less likely to experience <coughs> mental health problems. Uh, my Lords, a deaf person with a broken leg should be able to receive good care at their local hospital, provided a BSL interpreter is used. However, for mental health provision, a deaf or signing condition is needed. A therapeutic relationship needs to be established one-on-one -on -one and not via a third party. A specialised therapist would be in a much better position to spot visual clues um, that are relevant to diagnosis and treatment. For example, for example pressured signing and also alternative signs uh, uh, where some signs have a, a double meaning. My Lords, unfortunately, access to specialised support is not available in most parts of the country. This leads to a second rate and sometimes dangerous mm -hmm. service. The current tiers of service uh, within the United Kingdom are as follows. For inpatient services, there are currently three units uh, in Manchester, Birmingham and in London, as well as secure private units. This means for most deaf patients, their nearest inpatient unit is a considerable distance away. Turning to community provision, uh, provision this is supposed to be commissioned by NHS England. In practice, there is a postcode lottery. Deaf people in most parts of the country have no access to a specialised community service. The result is that deaf people are dependent on assessment and treatment from non-signing hearing professionals. This frequently leads to misdiagnosis, which can in turn exacerbate the initial problem. The lack of community teams also means that when deaf people are inpatients, they also have to they often have to stay longer than necessary in hospital because discharge is difficult because of the lack of community support. My Lords, turning to psychological therapies, the National Improving Access to Psychological Therapies, IAPT, <coughs> programme worked with strategic health authorities and primary care trusts to train deaf IAPT therapists. These therapists were employed by the charity Sign Health and commissioned by the PCTs to provide a regional and or local service. However, since the transfer of commissioning, these contracts have started to come to an end as co-commissioning groups have not been renewing the contracts. Indeed, as I speak, my Lords, the BSL IAPT service in Bristol, Bame, South Gloucestershire, Swindon and Wiltshire has announced that it is to close. The, close, the service will close at the end of March. It seems the CCGs are going back to commissioning IAPT services individually. As a result, there is no mechanism for them to join together again to commission a BSL service as part of the IAPT service. 
My Lords, in this situation, deaf people are usually told by they, their IAPT provider that they can book an interpreter if needed. This is a retrograde step and akin to offering an English speaker therapy with a foreign speaking therapist uh, with an interpreter if needed. While the BSL component may be a minor issue for the commissioners and providers, it is a huge issue for the deaf people themselves. Most will now go back to suffering in silence. So, my lords, this step backwards also means that deaf people can no longer self-refer to IAPT services and have to go through their GP, who in practice is often a barrier to accessing this service. It is very interesting to me and revealing that Sign Health's IAPT service had a recovery rate of 76% compared to a recovery rate of 44% achieved by hearing mainstream IAPT services. Adding, adding an interpreter to a therapeutic dynamic lessens the chance of a good therapeutic relationship and also adds to the cost. So, my Lords, I understand there has been meetings between Sign Health and the Minister Norman Lan in recent weeks. It is not yet clear whether a solution to this problem can be found um, by the Department of Health or by NHS England. The important thing, and indeed the purpose of this debate, is that deaf people have access to a BSL service wherever they live in the country. My Lords, I would like to mention a pilot service dealing with dementia in deaf people. The Deafness, Cognition and Language Research Centre works in partnership with the National Hospital for Neurology. This service is threatened with closure as it appears it does not fit in the commissioning structure we currently have. This is another example of services being so specialised and niche that co-commissioning groups, even clustered co-commissioning groups, would have too few patients to make it viable. My Lords, the problem is that the number of patients in each co-commissioning group is too small to commission effectively and there is no mechanism for them to cooperate nationally. There has never been national success in commissioning deaf mental health services at a local or regional level. Deaf mental health services have always been considered a low priority, no doubt because deaf people are largely a silent minority. Co-commissioning would be a backward step from where we are now, and where we are now is bad enough. If anything, psychological therapies need to move up to a national approach, with responsibility remaining local. Moving specialised services down would leave them in the same poor position as deaf IAPT services. My Lords, I've given the Minister notice of a couple of, question, a couple of questions, uh, and those are, firstly, what progress is there um, with moves to uh, commission a BSL IAPT service? And my second question for the Noble Lord, the Minister, is would the Minister commit to addressing the problem which I've outlined with um, BSL community and secondary services available to all um, BSL using deaf people? It has been suggested that a working party might be uh, set up um, as appropriate to address the issues I've raised um, today. My Lords, every BSL using deaf person deserves a care pathway. Currently, the pathway is broken and is getting worse, and this would not be acceptable for any hearing person in the United Kingdom. There is a wide acceptance among experts as what is needed, and I hope that the Minister will use this opportunity to set out the Government's plans for addressing the mental health needs of BSL using deaf people. I beg to move. My Lords, I would like to thank the Noble Lord, Lord Ponsonby, for securing this debate and drawing attention to this very important issue. A few weeks ago, I opened a debate uh, in, in this House about the many challenges confronting mental health services, as well as the important new policy uh, and service developments instigated by this government. And I particularly appreciate the chance to speak tonight about the problems that deaf people face in accessing effective mental health care. I think it's really important to remember that when we speak of deaf people, we speak of a large and extremely diverse group of people. There are 9 million deaf or hard of hearing people and 700,000 severely or profoundly deaf people in the UK, 50,000 of whom use British Sign Language as their first or preferred language. While some deaf people were deaf at birth, 
or from a young age, others become deaf late in life. The mental health needs of deaf people will differ, of course, depending on these factors. Nevertheless, deaf people as a group share a, a, a disproportionately pressing need for mental health care. 40% of deaf people, it has been estimated, have a mental illness. The prevalence of common mental disorders like anxiety and depression in the deaf community is nearly double that of the hearing population and behavioural and personality disorders are between two and five times more common among sign language users. Deaf children are particularly in need of mental health services as the particular challenges of their life make it more likely that they will experience mental health problems. More than 90% of deaf children are from families with no first-hand experience of deafness which can lead to isolation and troubled relationships with their families. And indeed, it is salutary to note that deaf children are twice as likely to be abused or neglected as hearing children. Let me now turn to the issue of prevention. For many people who lose their hearing as adults, the experience of becoming deaf can adversely affect their mental health. For example, research shows that older people with hearing loss are twice as likely to develop depression as their peers without hearing loss as well as increased feelings of loneliness and social isolation. Like other noble lords, I'm sure, I'm very conscious of this from the first-hand experience of close relatives. By providing people with hearing aids, we can reduce these risks. Those who wore hearing aids experienced less depression and anxiety, had more and better family and social relationships, and felt better about themselves than those who did not. My Lords, it is impossible to avoid the issue of funding, and it is complex. To set the overall context, whilst very welcome additional funding has been made available for specific mental health initiatives, our recent debates make clear that mainstream mental health services have suffered from disproportionate cuts in comparison with physical health services for both adults and children. And within this context, Specialist services for deaf people remain a particular concern, not least given the current architecture of health, serving, uh, health service commissioning. In short, whilst deaf secondary and tertiary mental health services are commissioned on a national basis, primary mental health services is the responsibility of local clinical commissioning groups. And this, of course, includes mental health services for deaf people. So whilst the specialist inpatient units for deaf people in London, Birmingham and Manchester that we've already heard about may receive adequate funding, commissioning for community services is extremely patchy. And that's mainly because the deaf, people, the, the deaf community within the area covered by HCCG is relatively small, so there is little incentive for them to prioritise the needs of deaf service users. And the result of this is that only a handful of, of services receive local uh, commissioning. Let me try to bring this to life a little. Until last year, deaf service users were able to access a deaf therapist fluent in sign language uh, through the British Sign Language Healthy Minds IAP service uh, developed by the charity Sign, po uh, Sign Health, already referred to by the noble Lord, Lord Ponsonby, and indeed with funding from the Department of Health. And that, that program, as we've already heard, was extremely successful and nearly doubled the, the rate of recovery from 44 to 75%. I think that's an extremely uh, impressive and important figure. But in the restructuring of the NHS, clinical commissioning groups were often hesitant to commission the service, preferring to use hearing therapists with interpreters, even though the evidence shows this is not as effective. Meanwhile, the service was often considered too small to qualify for national commissioning. And because of these challenges, the service is ra rapidly shrinking and some staff have been made redundant. So could uh, my noble friend, the Minister, say what the government is doing to support CCGs to increase the data collected in their local community to help inform mental health commissioning for deaf people? And my Lords, in such, in such circumstances, Deaf people seeking talking therapies, something I greatly support myself, often have little choice but to resort to mainstream <coughs> services. Deaf people are often not given adequate um, access to interpreters, as we have already heard. And indeed, a, a 2012 survey of the British Sign Language users found that 68 of, of respondents did not get an interpreter for their GP appointment, despite having asked for them. Many others must wait longer for treatment and travel further in, in order to secure access to an interpreter. 
So could my noble friend, the Minister, please indicate what plans the government have to increase the provision of medically skilled interpreter services? And my laws, even when there is access to an interpreter, going through therapy with, with an interpreter can present significant challenges. That 2012 survey I, I referred to indicated that 41% of deaf patients felt confused following their appointment as they had trouble understanding the interpreter. And this may be for cultural reasons. I think it's important to recognise that the life experiences of deaf people differ in ways that go well beyond language, especially if they've been deaf from birth or at a very young age. And indeed, the relationship between a hearing therapist uh, and a deaf service user can be made more difficult by these cultural barriers as well as linguistic ones. And it's no surprise or indeed criticism that mainstream health service, uh, mental health service providers often lack the specific expertise necessary to understand the unique life experiences of deaf people and, and to work effectively with deaf clients. It's just that a specialist service requiring specialist expertise is needed. Moreover, the inclusion of an interpreter uh, as already raised by the noble lord, Lord Ponsonby, inevitably changes the dynamic in a therapeutic situation in a way that can be detrimental. For example, the sorts of topics discussed in therapy can be difficult enough to tell to a therapist uh, without having to wonder whether one's words will be faithfully conveyed by the interpreter. And as the deaf community is small and close-knit, there's a real chance that the patient will know the interpreter and because qualified interpreters are hard to come by, the options are limited and there are few alternatives if a patient is uncomfortable with his or her interpreter. My Lords, as we've already heard, there are specialist um, inpatient psychiatric units for deaf people in London, Manchester and Birmingham. Um, but the quality of, that, of the care that deaf people receive is adversely affected by a lack of community resources. And a recent report by the National Deaf Mental Health Service has shown that deaf adults in specialist and general uh, inpatient programmes were in hospital for twice as long as hearing patients, not because of the actual clinical need, but because the community services they needed upon discharge were not available. And this current dearth of specialist services for deaf people, I would argue, um, is not inevitable. Uh, as Dr Sally Austin, a specialist for deaf people with mental health problems and a former chair of the British Society for Mental Health uh, and Deafness, has pointed out, if specialist deaf, deaf services were to include, also include partially deaf people, the economies of scale would change. And Dr Austin has also suggested that what's called telemental health, including things like online services, may also provide a, a solution for deaf pa patients with poor access to appropriate pr uh, providers from having to travel at very long distances. My Lords, this is an extremely important discussion, and yet not one we've often had. The last government strategy on this topic was back in 2005. And if nothing else, what we've already heard, and, and I know there's more to come, about the wide array of challenges that deaf people face in securing uh, access to mental health care, surely that should convince us of the importance of updating our aims for uh, this sort of health care provision in, in the future. So could I finally ask uh, my noble friend, the Minister, what plans the government has to update the 2005 Mental Health and Deafness Towards Equity and Access document so it can become the cornerstone of all our work. My Lords, the UK has a proud history of providing excellent mental health services for deaf people. It will be a tragedy to neglect that history by failing to give deaf people the access to therapy they so clearly need and deserve. Yeah. <coughs> My Lords, I declare an interest as a trustee of the Ewing Foundation for Deaf Children. I am grateful to the noble Lord, to the Lord Ponsonby, for again raising for debate important issues on deafness. But I rather disagree with the Neville Lord on his definition of deafness. It should not be defined as the characteristic of those who use sign language, because there are a host of elderly deaf people who don't use BSL, and there are many children born with a profound hearing loss who now have cochlear implants, which, although leaving them with still with significant hearing impairment, enables them to communicate in spoken languages. Similarly, improvements in hearing aid technology have made it easier for other deaf children to communicate in a spoken language. The Oxford English Dictionary defines deaf as lacking the power of hearing or having impaired hearing, and that is a definition, the definition we should use. 
A definition that depends on BSL implies that BSL is the only char characteristic, and that is problematic. Today's debate is particularly important because there are a lot of evidence of depression and mental health il il illness issues among deaf people, including those who use sign language. All the evidence suggests that hearing loss can substantially increase the risk of mental health problems. Anxiety, paranoia and depression are particular risks. Those with hearing loss are overrepresented among samples of patients suffering from paranoid psychosis in later life. And older people with hearing loss are more than twice as likely to develop depression as their peers without hearing loss. So, my lords, it is important that the appropriate mental health services are available for deaf people and that the right steps are being taken to improve outcomes. I know that some will argue that because not everyone can use sign language, deaf people who use it may experience depression and mental health issues even more acutely. Deaf people using sign language to communicate may have fewer opportunities to access appropriate specialist services too. And there are still a few children who use BSL as their only language, who would struggle to access mainstream mental health services because of language barriers. There is no doubt, this no doubt accentuates the feelings of frustration. There is research showing that deaf children who live in families where BSL is the only language are less likely to experience mental health problems than deaf children in families that use English. If you can't communicate with your family, then it's little wonder that you feel isolated. However, that research is dated. My Lord's new technology, like digital hearing aids and cochlear implants, are reducing the need for the BSL language. And early detection is further, further breaking down the reliance on BSL. We have to remember one crucial point in this debate. There is a whole range of deafness, and not all the people on the spectrum use BSL. But new technology and early detection does mean that many more can take a full and active part in a hearing society, while still being able to use sign language if they choose. Doors are opening, and many deaf people, or partially deaf people, can enjoy the best, best of both worlds rather than be becoming frustrated by the limitations of just one. Being able to access both deaf and hearing communities is going to be good for the mental health of those with hearing difficulties. My Lords, there is much more care being taken to focus on the mental and emotional health of deaf children. The National Sensory Impairment Partnership has worked with the National Deaf Children's Society producing documents for teachers of the deaf on emotional well-being. The website for the National Sensory Impairment Partnership has published guidance for teachers on how to deliver a course called Think Right, Feel Good. This helps teachers understand and develop emotional resilience in deaf children. My Lords, there are a host of foreign languages in the UK. All speakers of unusual languages have the same problem. Inability to communicate, except in their own community. The number of deaf young people who are reliant on BSL to communicate and access teaching and learning has declined very significantly, and this will be reflected over the next few years in the adult population. I am full of admiration for the wonderful children who use BSL while learning to read and write English at the same time. But technology is changing that, and we have to embrace it. It's so exciting that we can bring deaf people into the speaking world. Look at the new apps available on smartphones nowadays. Google Translate and Skype Translator both instantly translate foreign languages. Siri is starting to do so on the Apple products. The app Mimics says that it will simultaneously translate from English into American Sign Language. Motion Savvy will translate the other way. I'm sure it's not perfect yet, but a great start would be for BSL users to carry this sort of technology when having a vital, co vital conversation with a doctor. This is a story of success, not perfect by any means, but apparently getting better. It is, of course, very sad that the situation was so bad in the past, but the important thing is that things get better, and it will be ameliorated by technology, 
not by government expenditure. My Lords, the overall priority should be to integrate deaf children into society. And as a fully integrated group, they will have, no doubt, a similar incidence of mental illness and tooth decay and cancer as the rest of society. Any incidence of mental illness is appalling. I'm not sure that it is sadder because the victim is deaf than because the victim speaks Pashto or Welsh. Can I ask my noble friend the Minister if he's able to publish data on the characteristics of children referred to specialist deaf mental health services? What percentage of the children are lip readers, use BSL or, or have cochlear implants? I believe more information will only help us learn and improve. It would be very helpful to see the data on the characteristic of children referred to specialist child and adolescent mental health services to see what we can learn. If we were aware of the most common profiles of children referred to specialist services, perhaps this would inform preventative work and where it should be targeted. My Lords, uh, in this short debate, when you come in at the end, it isn't uncommon to uh, have much of what you've said already been touched upon. But in this debate, I'm afraid there has been the banging of guns and the falling foxes all over the place. I am left by saying that much of what we started, as my noble friend has already spoken here, was touched upon when we had our debate on mental health earth. And I spoke about then about the fact that all disability groups are overrepresented within the mental health sector. End of story. Anybody who has a problems in the outside world and suffers more stress, this will keep their mental health issues. It's actually as night follows day. However, what do we do to actually uh, ameliorate the situation is the question here. Now, the noble Lord Ponsonby has rightly pointed out one particular group because, my lords, the whole question is brought into focus when you look at a group. You see the specifics as opposed to the general, uh, the general. And the whole spectrum here is made up of a series of specific points. British Sign Language users are going to have their own specific problems here. They are specific, as the noble Lord Borick has just said, to a section of those who actually have hearing problems or hearing loss. But it is quite a profound group, and it's how we access and make sure they are receive support that we are looking at here. Even if the Noble Lord uh, is right, and they are going to be a declining group, they are still going to have problems going on into the future. They are still going to be there. They must still be addressed. Because, my Lords, if you don't, address them, you actually save up problems and costs and inconvenience for the rest of society on an ongoing process. So I do congratulate him for raising this, because unless you actually concentrate in this way, it becomes a generality. And I very much commend him for so doing. Now, when it comes to technology, and here, my lords, I must declare an interest. I am the uh, chairman of a country called a company called Microlink, which actually deals with technology. There is a lot of interesting stuff outside there that addresses uh, or can be some, of some assistance to those with various spectrums of hearing loss. It's already been spoken. There are dozens of ways. When you play with language, you translate it. There are things going forward that can be used, and we have probably only just started to touch on this. Anything that can translate uh, language into text. I mean, I use it myself as a dyslexic. There are dozens of bits of technology out there. But it has been pointed out to me at considerable force when I started doing research on this that the deaf community across the spectrum are already using an incredibly widespread piece of technology. It's called texting. I was said when I was doing work on this, and this hadn't occurred to me at all. Oh, mobile phones. What phone? I'm part of the generation that regards a phone as something you talk to. I apparently am in the Stone Age here. <coughs> phones that you actually can text upon, which use a more simple, less elaborate grammar, are actually a very common way of communicating um, in the deaf community. Do health workers and my lords, we never Lord Ponsonby spoke about this before, the same problems. Do health workers, both mental health and normal health, actually know that this is a way of establishing communication? 
a way of establishing communication that means you may well find an easier path through to the, when you get the sign language interpreter. Sign language uh, interpreters or users of sign language for therapy. It may, may well be have some form of uh, backup to the primary function, the primary talking tools for all uh, cures for all forms of mental health, which are generally regarded as being better, more longer lasting, more maintainable than simply pumping for somebody full of drugs, even if drugs have to be used at the same time. Unless there is some way of actually bringing all these things in together to get the best out of the situation, we are going to be missing a trick. My lords, unless we actually learn to use this technology that is coming through, that is increasingly available, and here I am probably shooting my own company in the foot, that is readily available and is used properly, we are going to actually incur more on costs. A little bit of awareness training, saying to people in casualty, if somebody comes in a very distressed state, have you tried communicating with them by text? This may well relieve some of this stress. It may well identify the symptoms quicker. Could this not be worked in? A little bit of guidance here, a little bit of guidance there, trying to work, trying to work through. Other forms of communication, my favourite one is one called the Ubi Duo. Not only do I like saying the word, my lords, but, uh, or words, I think it might be, but the fact that it's, that is instant typing to another screen that translates straight away, effectively. Just do it, carry it around, about the size of a, uh, the whole thing is about the size of a laptop, a traditional laptop. That would be more appropriate for those who have good uh, written skills, good use of written language uh, going through. But there are lots of uh, very established pieces of tech which we are not getting the best out of. We really aren't. We will always, I feel, for the foreseeable future at least, need people who are uh, counsellors who are skilled using the sign language, the specific language with its rules of grammar and nuance and indeed cultural references. But we may well be to support them and take some of the stress off them by using the technology at the same time. My Lords, when all said and done, the technology is generally cheaper. If we concentrate and make a funnel through to those very valuable and in times irreplaceable people, we will surely be doing all of ourselves a favour. Yeah. Yeah. Lords, um, I, I would like to add a couple of, couple of points to this debate um, from my experience as um, a psychiatrist. We've heard that deaf people continue to face unacceptable inequities in access to mental health services, and that this is particularly the case for the estimated 25,000 deaf people in the UK who use British Sign Language as their first or only language. And deaf BSL users from black and minority ethnic communities or who have additional needs arising from comorbid visual impairment or intellectual disability encounter even greater obstacles to accessing mental health services. My Lords, we've heard that deaf children are more likely to experience emotional, physical or sexual abuse and that these are, are contributory to later mental health problems. But deaf adults are much less likely to know how to report suspicions of abuse and, and thus children living in deaf communities are more likely to have their experience of abuse go unnoticed and unreported. Um, the community interest company Books Beyond Words that I chair has been commissioned by the NSPCC to help them develop pictorial resources to um, improve uh, the reporting of such abuse um, to organisations such as the NSPCC. My Lords, we've heard that many deaf people leave GP consultations with no understanding of what went on and consequently avoid going to see their GP altogether. Research has shown that a shocking one in seven people with hearing loss have missed a healthcare appointment because they did not hear their name being called in the waiting room. These access problems continue despite the Disability Discrimination Act's requirement for reasonable adjustments to be made, and they are compounded by a lack of deaf awareness training for professionals working in healthcare settings. Within mainstream mental health services, few staff possess the BSL skills and experience needed to work effectively with deaf BSL users. 
And in, in addition, mental health services frequently just fail to arrange for BSL interpreters to be present at appointments, often relying on family members, including children, to act as informal interpreters. This practice is unjustifiable, particularly in mental health services, where sensitive and personal issues, sometimes including abuse, may be disclosed. There's an ongoing shortage of BSL interpreters as well, and a lack of specialist training for those who wish to work with people with mental health needs. Can the Minister tell us what steps the Government will take to increase the number of BSL interpreters within mental health services? The Sion Health Charity, however, highlights that over the last three years, they have trained 18 deaf and three hearing BSL users to work as psychological wellbeing practitioners in several geographic regions, but only seven are currently employed, reflecting a lack of recognition of the need for their services. Does the Minister agree that such provision would constitute a reasonable adjust adjustment? And can the Noble Lord assure the House that action will be taken to improve deaf people's access to IAP services provided by therapists sufficiently fluid in BSL. Deaf people are also overrepresented in secure mental health settings and are thought to be overrepresented in the prison population, which may reflect a prior failure to address their mental health needs at an earlier stage in their lives. It suggests the need for specialist prison in-reach services so that deaf people with mental health needs can be identified and supported. I wish to highlight the importance of addressing the social determinants of mental well-being in deaf people, the exclusion, isolation and barriers that deaf people experience in education and employment and in the community can negatively impact on their social and emotional well-being, along with their education and employment outcomes, thus perpetuating the cycle of adversity which puts them at greater risk of mental health difficulties. Can the Minister assure the House that recommendations to address these factors will be included in the Government's forthcoming action plan on hearing loss? I had um, a couple of examples given to me by psychiatrists working in one of the National Deaf Mental Health Services, particularly about uh, children that he visited in mainstream schools, one child using only BSL in a mainstream school where nobody knows BSL, um, and another school where the young person in a special school whose only language was BSL was in a class with seven young people with learning disabilities, none of whom were deaf or knew BSL. This is clearly unacceptable and um, I look forward to the Minister's response and thank uh, the Noble Lord Lord Ponsonby for raising these important matters. Well, my Lords, I too would like to thank my noble friend for introducing this debate and also to thank Sign Health for their very valuable briefing. Can I say uh, I very much welcome Lord Warwick's uh, input, but I think my noble friend was quite specific uh, in the question he asked. And uh, I fully accept, my Lords, that however wide you define deafness, the scale of mental health problems uh, is seriously uh, is serious and deserving of, of, of attention. I thought the noble Lord, Lord Addington, put it well. Um, the focus on British Sign Language users is valuable in itself. But also, it's a signal uh, of more general problems. Uh, and my Lord's um, interesting uh, work published very recently in the BMJ has shown that, uh, I mean, first of all, I think this is well known that deaf adults in the UK occupy poorer socioeconomic positions, have poor literacy, and have limited access to communicate through speech. Um, their health is generally poorer than that of the general population with problem under diagnosis and under treatment of chronic conditions. My Lords, as far as mental health is concerned, other research shows that 40% of deaf people are likely to experience a mental health problem. Whilst the incident rate of schizophrenia is probably similar to that of the hearing population, the rate of common mental health problems is much higher. And again, my Lords, going back to the BMJ research published uh, only a week ago, um, the rates of depression self-reported by deaf participants was 24% overall, 32% for women and 14% for men. And my Lords, it, it does seem to me that in any uh, response to the mental health issues facing many deaf people, what is abundantly clear that at the moment, uh, as the noble Baroness Lady Tyler uh, said, there is no national strategy at all 
that one can turn to which will actually describe what kind of services deaf people could expect um, from the NHS. Uh, my lords, I think then that also um, is related to a confusion about what should be commissioned at national level and what should be commissioned at local level. And I have to say, my lords, we are seeing lots of indications that clinical commissioning groups find it very difficult to commission services for what inevitably will be a small group of population uh, in their area. Equally, my lords, I'd fully accept that not all that can be commissioned at a national level. And it does seem to me that um, we need to find a way which will actually help clinical commissioning groups commission services locally for these smaller population groups so there is much more of a cohesive approach. Left to themselves, CCGs, I think, will not do it. And that really is the real problem that we face um, alongside the funding issues around commissioning at a national level for specialty services. This is not an easy issue, but, my laws, we have to do better than we do at, at the moment. Well, there was a number of noble lords who referred to the position facing specialty services, and I would just like to really add to the points raised by my noble friend uh, about this. I particularly, my lords, would like to raise the question of the Deafness Cognition and Language Research Centre at University College London. Uh, my lords, uh, I understand that they are putting a costed business case together for a national neurological service for British Sign Language deaf users. Uh, and I understand, my lords, they've met uh, with uh, Norman Lamb. Uh, they've also met my colleague, Andrew Gwynne. And this does have, uh, clearly, um, cross-party support. And they are putting a business case forward to secure the presence of a clinic beyond 2015. And I don't know if the Noble Earl would be able to update me on progress uh, in this area. My Lords, again, my noble friend and other noble Lords have mentioned the improving access to psychological therapies service, which showed very, very promising results um, from the date of its introduction. Other noble Lords have referred to the outcome measures. This, my Lords, has clearly fallen foul of the problem of being delegated to clinical commissioning groups to commission. They are clearly not going to do so. I had the privilege of meeting uh, with Sign Health, Mr Norman Lamb. We had a very good hearing, and I was left with considerable optimism that some way would be found to fund this. And again, if the Noble Earl were able to give us some update progress on that, I would be very grateful indeed. My Lords, again, it comes back to this point that if left to local CCGs, there is no hope for services that need a contribution from each CCG to make it viable. And one way or another, my lords, we have to find a way for there to be some kind of, of national leadership. And indeed, my lords, if I, I were to ask for one thing above all else, it is that the Noble Earl would see if his department is prepared to produce some kind of cohesive strategy around deaf issues, uh, of mental health issues for deaf people, which I think would then give us some encouragement that we would be able to tackle these issues in a coherent way. Uh, my Lords, uh, I must say that I always thought national service frameworks were a very good idea. I'm not sure the current government <coughs> thinks so. But if we're not to have national service frameworks, we need something in their place. My Lords, <clears throat> could I just ask him about the quality duty in relation to deaf people? Does the Minister, is he satisfied that the NHS understand their responsibilities under the equality duty? Um, the Noble Baroness Lady Holland suggested that many staff in the health service are very much unaware of the issues that deaf people, the barriers they face. And I think, my lords, the issue here is that we lack national standards against which local NHS bodies can judge their performance. And my lords, the noble Baroness Lady Hollins 
raised the question about reception and waiting room experience. And the fact is, my lords, um, there has been work that showed <coughs> that 90% of deaf people have missed many GP appointments through not hearing their name called out in the surgery. It's just one example of some of the communication problems that they face. My lords, probably at this point, it'd be better if I sat down and gave the minister even more time to answer the questions. My Lords, may I begin by thanking the noble Lord Lord Punsonby for securing this short debate on the mental health of deaf people who use British Sign Language. There are over 10 million adults in England living with some degree of hearing loss, and whilst some will be amongst the one in 700 babies born with hearing loss, many of us will develop hearing loss over the course of our lifetime. And with an ageing population, this figure is only going to increase, with the World Health Organisation predicting that by 2030 there will be an estimated 14.5 million people in the UK with hearing loss, with adult onset hearing loss predicted to be among the UK's top 10 disease burdens. We know from research that deaf people are at a much higher risk of mental ill health than the general population with 40% of the hearing impaired population and 50% of the profoundly deaf expected to experience mental health problems during the course of their lifetime, compared to around 25% within the general population. It is therefore vitally important that we provide deaf people with appropriate services which support their mental health needs. The government is committed to improving mental health services and ensuring that mental health services have equal priority with those for physical health. Our mandate to NHS England makes it clear that everyone, and I emphasise everyone, who needs it should have timely access to evidence-based services. Over £400 million is being invested over the spending review period to make a choice of psychological therapies available for all those who need them in all parts of England. And we've put in place for the very first time waiting time standards in mental health, a significant milestone on the road to parity. The NHS is a universal service, and I, um, I listened with care to the remarks from the noble Lord, Lord Hunt, uh, about equality. NHS England is under a specific legal requirement in relation to tackling health inequalities and advancing equality. The Government will hold NHS England to account for how well it discharges this duty. We recognise the importance of deaf people being supported and enabled to communicate through British Sign Language where they wish to do so. Section 20 of the Equality Act 2010 requires CCGs to make reasonable adjustments so that disabled people are not placed at a substantial disadvantage compared to non-disabled people. The reasonable adjustment duty is an anticipatory duty, meaning that service providers are expected to anticipate the requirements of disabled people and the reasonable adjustments that may have to be made for them in advance before any disabled person attempts to access the service in question. Simply put, it is not acceptable for health services not to be equipped to provide communication support for those who need it. Equality legislation means that service providers and public bodies must provide a reasonable adjustment to their services to meet the needs of their clients when it's reasonable to do so. This may be the provision of interpreters or services delivered in BSL. In September 2013, the Prescribed Specialised Services Advisory Group, PSAG, considered a proposal from Sign Health for NHS England to commission psychological therapies for deaf sign language users. The PSAG felt that although the provision of IAPT services using BSL was clearly complex, it did not meet the requirements for a specialised service commissioned directly by NHS England and therefore responsibility for commissioning psychological therapies for deaf sign language users should remain with clinical commissioning groups. The PSAG recommended that CCGs be signposted to the relevant organisations and informed about the services and support they could provide to deaf patients. From his remarks, uh, the noble Lord Lord Punsonby was clearly in favour of community and secondary deaf 
mental health services being commissioned as a specialised service. Uh, he will understand, I'm sure, that any proposal of that kind would need to be considered by the PSAG. Um, however, <coughs> uh, as regards <coughs> um, NHS England retaining responsibility for existing specialised deaf mental health services, even if co-commissioning were introduced, I can give uh, him an assurance that at this time NHS England will retain the responsibility as set out in the mandate and the manual for prescribed services for the specialised uh, deaf services. Future collaborative commissioning arrangements have not been, <coughs> excuse me, have not been confirmed as yet, but that will not alter NHS England's responsibilities as the responsible commissioner. But we know that more needs to be done. And as the noble Lord, Lord Punsonby mentioned, my honourable friend, the Minister for Care Services, Norman Lamb, recently met with Sign Health. And I would like, uh, like at this point to pay tribute to the exceptional work of Sign Health in promoting the same sort of access to health care and health information for deaf people as hearing people receive. I, I myself have visited uh, Sign Health on more than one occasion. Sign Health impressed. Uh, upon uh, my honourable friend the importance of psychological therapies for deaf people through the improving access to psychological therapies service. Since the meeting, officials have been working to develop proposals in support of the commissioning and provision of psychological therapies for deaf people in England. The noble Lord Lord Punsonby asked whether a working group could be established to look at this issue further. I. Um, I believe that that is a sensible suggestion and I am happy to commit to it. In the meantime, we will be reminding clinical commissioning groups of the importance of commissioning IAPT services that are accessible to British sign language users. My Lords, we are committed to delivering health outcomes that are among the best in the world for people with hearing loss. We have made considerable improvements over recent years, including the rollout of a national screening programme for newborn children, significantly reducing waiting times for assessment and treatment, and greater choice of hearing aid services, for example, through independent high street providers. In NHS England is developing a new accessible information standard which will provide clear guidance to health and social care organisations on the steps they need to take to ensure that disabled patients, carers and service users receive information in appropriate formats and communication support if they need it. This will include the provision of interpreters or BSL users for deaf people. NHS England have worked closely with Sign Health in the development of the standard, and Sign Health have been offered uh, have uh, have offered uh, advice about particular aspects of the standard which relate to deaf people. It's anticipated that the standard will be published in the spring, and that organisations would then have 12 months to implement it. Alongside the statutory information standard, NHS England will also publish guidance on making reasonable adjustments to meet the communication needs of service users with disabilities. As well as an information standard, NHS England, alongside the Department of Health, are developing an action plan on hearing loss which will identify the key actions that will make a real difference to improve the lives of all those with hearing loss. The action plan is in its final stages of development with a view to publishing it uh, soon. And I hope that goes some way to address the question from the Noble Lord Lord Hunt ab about uh, a national service framework or the equivalent thereof. Um, Turning to some of the questions I was asked, and I, I shall, of course, uh, write to those uh, noble lords whose questions I am unable to answer in, uh, in the debate. Uh, my noble friend, uh, Lady Tyler, uh, asked me several questions. Uh, first of all, about the 2005 document, Mental Health and Deafness, Towards Equity and Access. Um, I, I, I have to tell her there are no plans to update uh, that particular document. But she also asked me, as did the, my noble friend, Lord Borick, uh, about what we were doing to support CCGs to increase the data collected in, in their local community to help inform mental health commissioning for deaf people. Our goal is to create the most open and transparent healthcare system in the world. To support this ambition, we need to build a truer, more up-to-date picture of mental health and well-being, both nationally and in each area. 
The current level of information collected on IAPT represents the gold standard of data collection. We have robust information on the numbers of people accessing services, how long they wait, how many recover or improve as a result of treatment, and the cost of these services, a genuine world first in mental health. Our ambition is to bring this same standard of information to all mental health services uh, over time. Um, my noble friend and the noble Baroness Lady Hollins asked about the supply of medically skilled interpreter services. It is clear that we need to work across government and with the voluntary and public sector to encourage more people to come forward to train and qualify as BSL interpreters. We know that it takes at least three to five years to train a person in BSL to level three, which is a basic requirement for a therapist uh, stroke clinician. NHS England advised us that this will be addressed within a framework for workforce planning uh, going forward. Uh, my noble friend, uh, Lord Borick, um, uh, spoke with tremendous authority about the mental health needs of deaf uh, children. Um, children's and young people's mental health is a key priority for the government, as I hope he, he knows. And in August 2014, we launched the Children and Young People's Mental Health and Wellbeing Task Force. That task force brings together a range of experts uh, and it is looking at how to improve the way children and young people's mental health services are organised, commissioned and provided, and how to make it easier for young people to access help and support, including in schools, through voluntary organisations and online. And that includes, very definitely, deaf children with mental health uh, problems. Um, uh, my noble friend Lord Addington um, uh, spoke uh, very powerfully about the use of technology, such as... Uh, 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 about the use of technology. Um, obviously, as he will understand, um, this is a decision for individual providers, but the NHS's ambition is to embrace technology as part of its drive to offer modern, convenient and responsive services to patients, their families and carers. General practices are leading the way on that. Amongst these, NHS England is working with local commissioners and is undertaking a number of pilots to redefine and improve the designs of the future NHS 111 service, which includes improvements to the text relay service, making it easier for text relay users to navigate to a service provider. Uh, as regards delivery uh, of psychological therapies to deaf people, we're currently exploring the commissioning of online BSL or text-based models of delivery. Um, the Noble Lord Lord Hunt asked me about the UCLH project. Uh, UC University College London has developed a case with the Deafness, Cognition and Languages Research Centre on what a deaf uh, cognitive service should look like. We understand that proposals for the future of the services are currently under discussion. My Lords, I hope that in the time available I've been able to reassure uh, the Noble Lord Lord Ponsonby and indeed the House of this Government's continued commitment to meeting the specific needs of deaf people and that we take this particular issue very seriously.